Welcome to our webinar today. Um, this webinar is brought to you by the ASQ Statistics Division and the CPID Division. Um, our webinar today is called Deploying DOE to Identify Vital Factors that Affect Quality. Um, we have a great presenter here today, well experienced. His name is Mark Anderson. He's an engineering consultant with StatEase. Um, prior to joining the firm, he spearheaded an award-winning quality improvement program for an international specialty chemical manufacturer, generating millions of dollars in profit. He offers a diverse array of experience in process development, quality assurance, and general management. Mark is also the lead author of three books on a variety of DOE topics. Um, he has published numerous articles on design of experiments. And he is also a guest lecturer at the University of Minnesota Chemical Engineering and Material Science Department, the Ohio State University Fisher College of Business and South Dakota Mines Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering. And he's going to talk with us today. So um, welcome to Mark. And then we have just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, everybody's going to be muted today. So if you have questions, you can type those into your chat function. We will answer the questions at the end of the talk. You can also reach me um, uh, post, uh, in the chat and I will help you with any technical questions or anything. Um, yep, just drop your questions in the chat and we'll help you out. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mark. Thanks. Okay, much appreciated. And then I'm, I'm very happy to be speaking to the stat division of ASQ and CPID and all those good folks uh, that have come on today. I've been a member since the 1970s. Um, I started off as a chemical engineer in process development for General Mills Research. And that's where I learned the hard way that statistics are your friend and you really need to embrace them to avoid chasing after false positive results in particular. So I really you know, picked up on these tools with the aid of General Mills and uh, with their background with stats, you know, from agronomy and then over to the chemical division. So that was a great experience. Um, my CQE came in when I started doing plant process improvement. And, you know, at that point in time, I was involved in a corporate wide quality program. And so I've just been a strong uh, believer in quality and ASQ, you know, for decades and decades. So hopefully this is a little bit of payback to tell you some things that I've learned over the years that at least uh, I think will be helpful. Some of it is somewhat opinionated, I, I would admit, but I've got a lot of experience and I've learned a few things over the years. So here's the payback, deploying DOE to identify vital factors that affect quality. And so in this presentation, I wanna really demonstrate how DOE design of experiments can provide huge process improvements, particularly with small screening studies where you're doing a broad and shallow experiment that is primarily aimed at detecting main effects, but it can be very, very important uh, to making breakthroughs. So that is something, of course, that we should do. But on the other hand, I'm constantly seeing people uh, talking about low resolution two level designs which I represent as two to the power of K minus P. The minus P indicates the fraction, the K, the number of factors, and the two being that it's a two level design. These designs are, are very effective, but if they're run very, very fractional, so the resolution is so low that main effects become alias with two factor interactions, then they don't work as well. Unfortunately, another flavor of design called Plackett Bermans, I'm gonna call those PBs, has become even more popular than the standard two to the K minus B because of their flexibility of being able to be done in runs of four. And for example, you go to a 12 run, a 20 run, but I'm constantly seeing people come to me even today. Somebody came to me and said, I'm interested in running Plackett Bermans for screening and Box Benkins. Um, why they picked up on those two designs, the Box Benkin is fine, but the Plackett Berman is one that I would use only for ruggedness testing. So I'm going to try to make a, a case for not doing it, that you, this is something you don't do. And then uh, if you do run the Plackett Bermans, which are good for ruggedness testing, 
The advantage of them and the other Resolution 3 standard designs is that you can do a follow-up on them to kind of fix it up. And the follow-up is going to be what's called a fold-over. Uh, I would say do if you must. So what I'm really aiming for is that people would start off with a higher resolution four, which means that main effects are only as alias with three factor interactions. We can work our fingers on that one. Two factor interactions are still alias with other two factor. So that's still an issue, but even if you go from the resolution three on the regular two level or the Black at Bermans, which are resolution three, if you upgrade to resolution four from the start, this is a do it right the first time, which was actually one of the slogans I was promoting when I was with General Mills Chemical, you know, doing corporate wide quality program, do it right the first time. And George Box said, when I attended a seminar in Madison back in 96, if you're gonna do something, you might as well do it right. So it's kind of the same idea. So in the process of all this, hopefully there's some enlightenment on the fine line of reliable screening at a minimum number of runs or going beyond that line and getting into these low resolution designs. I have a lot of material to cover, so, so bear with me. I'm gonna go at top speed. I've got lots of demonstrations to provide. So as I mentioned, the focus of this presentation is gonna be screening, but keep in mind that there's a whole strategy of experimentation, which I call SCORE which is not only screening at the start to maybe find some previously overlooked factors that are vital to your uh, process, characterization, which gets into the two-factor interactions in a more in-depth way, optimization, which is a response surface method, or RSM, Box Benkin, I mentioned that as one of them, and somebody else today asked me about central composite design, which are two of the standard optimization type tools for RSM. And then the ruggedness comes into play at the end. And uh, I do like ruggedness testing. I'm a member of ASTM E1169 standard for ruggedness. It's designed for test method ruggedness, but it's very good for any system, a process or product. And this is one where you do use oftentimes the Plaquette Berman designs. So at this stage, I kind of like the Plaquette Bermans, but further up, I don't, as you'll see. So uh, I do hear from a lot of people just about every single day in my role with Stadis. At this point, I'm working at about 60%, and you may see overhead a fan that might indicate to you that I'm at a winter home in Florida, um, but I'm working hard at a distance. And so nowadays, I've gone full circle from running the company to strictly doing engineering type work and helping people. So I spent a lot of time talking to actual experimenters, including this pharma process developer, who asked me to try to make sense from this two to the K minus P quote unquote screening experiment. And if you look at this, this is from our design builder and I think other software has something similar and it's very similar to Box Hunter and Hunter textbook statistics for experimenters, 1979, their table, only we've got the color coding on ours but you'll see that what, what this pharma process developer picked was seven factors in eight runs. And you would think that a person would notice that there's a red color here and they should stop and think about this. And up here, it does say that these red designs are good for ruggedness testing, but it turns out they're not really good for screening. You really should go to one of these yellow designs. So if this individual had gone just one notch up to here, it would have been fine. But then to compound the issue, they took this design and they replicated it. That, that was really frustrating for me to see that, but it's not an uncommon mistake to take something that's poor and make a copy of it. And a copy of a copy that's poor already is just gonna be just as poor. When they could have increased the resolution at the same time increasing the number of runs. And then just a minor peccadillo was they put one center point in and I usually don't recommend putting in center points at the stage of screening, but if you do, I recommend putting in three or four. I like having four. Just one is sample size one is not a good thing. It doesn't really help you a lot to get the advantage of a center point. Okay, so as I said, 
going in reverse now, doing only one center point is not effective. Uh, and probably do none or do four. So that's uh, detailed here. And then rather than doing a resolution three red ruggedness test with seven factors and eight runs, and then replicating to 16, would have been far better off going to the unreplicated resolution four yellow screening design with seven factors and 16 runs. And so what I want to do here is demonstrate this using a tool from Stadis called 360. And because I've got a lot of little things I'm going to show here, I've got a script, which you can see in small red print on your screen. And then I printed it out for myself to follow here because there's a lot of moving parts here. So what I'm going to do to start with is I'm going to open up the Stadis tool, the software, which is called Stadis 360. And some of you may be familiar with our software design expert, which has been around for many decades. Um, and then more recently, we did a superset called 360 that includes Python scripting. If anybody's interested in accessing the world of Python programming, that's there. And it also has um, more specialized designs for computer experiments, such as space filling, Latin hypercube, and tools for fitting called Gaussian process models. And uh, that's something that I'm talking to a group I'm training this week that are doing work for the Space Force of all things. And they're all system analysts and they're gonna be working with simulations. But for your garden variety pharma scientists and things like that, um, then you know we would use the tools of design expert that are embedded in 360. And so um, the way that we would go with this is we'd start with a regular two level and the design that uh, this fellow ran is shown here with seven factors and eight runs, and then the one center point. Now we have a, a little warning that pops up that says there really is no reason to do just one center point. You have no statistical power for checking for curvature. So normally, uh, hopefully they would see that and say, well, no, and then take that center point off. All right, but now we get into issues of the resolution, which is my main theme here. And we see straight away that the main effects labeled with one letter are all aliased with three two-factor interactions, you know, because of the structure of this design. And, and so it really isn't a very good design if there's any possibility of a two-factor interaction. As a chemical engineer, of course, I'm very, nervous about two-factor interactions because chemicals are interacting all the time. I don't think two-factor interactions are tremendously common, but you should be on guard for them. And you don't want to take a chance at a confusion like this, in my opinion. Now, another aspect of this whole um, idea of designing experiments is power. And let's just say that the individual here is interested in detecting a signal of three or more. Anything less than three is not important but they have to deal with a standard deviation overall in their process sampling and testing of 1.8. So I, I kind of concocted this um, here and we see that the power is 50.7. Now that's for one replication and they did uh, have, you know, the, uh, the intelligence to do two replicates of this, you know, ostensibly to get more power. I'm sure that's what they were thinking because when you do two replicates of it, well, then the power does increase to, you know, more than what well, we really need. 80% is kind of a general rule of thumb. And Professor Gary Oler at the School of Statistics that helped develop this for studies told me at one point that actually, if you go 95% or higher, you're overpowering the design. And so a sweet spot, he said, was between 80 and 95%, you know, to just right size the experiment. So this is about the right size, but we've got this problem of the aliasing. So uh, now if we redo this by not doing two replicates, but just do one of the 16 runs, but increase it to this seven and 16 option, which is a yellow option. And this is a two level design with seven factors. It's a one eighth fraction, which is a minus three. And it's resolution four, which is that Roman numeral and these are good for screening. And the reason is that 
if you're really just looking to eliminate previously unknown factors, and maybe most of them are not active in your system, then this would be a good strategy of experimentation. Maybe no two-factor interactions will come up and that's fine, then you've accomplished your mission. But if they do, you figure you'll sort those out later in the next phase, which is characterization. All right, now we've got 16 runs and let's look at the power of that. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that's fine. It's gonna give you plenty of power. Um, and so we would be good to go at this point. Okay, so that's my first uh, demonstration, just you know, showing you a common mistake that people make. They try to screen with a resolution three design and then to compound the matters, they replicate it to get more power, but they, they could have gone to a higher resolution and gotten the same increase in power. And then the center points are just kind of a little sideline, but it's another mistake to do just one and maybe they should do none. So let's say that uh, we do this and we need to salvage the situation. There is a way to do this. And oftentimes I do get these questions come in. They've already done the experiment and now what? And this is mindful of what Ronald Fisher, the inventor of modern day statistics said is that a statistician is more like a pathologist than a medical doctor. They can declare the patient dead, but they can't bring it back to life. <laughs> Fortunately, we have a chance of bringing this back to life. And so now let's go back and let's say that we run this design with seven factors and eight runs with one replicate and no center points, just to kind of keep it a little bit simpler. If you run a resolution three like this, and it, it can be done with pocket Bermans also, and you feel like uh, you kind of got off track here because potentially there could be main effects that are being confused with two-factor interactions. As many of you probably know, there's a technique that's been around for a long time. It's called a foldover. And so just to show you how that can be done, we can take this design and augment it. And the, this program has already recognized that this is probably gonna be the next step that will double the number of runs in order to increase the resolution and clear up some inconvenient aliases. And it's usually done when the design is highly fractionated. Well, that's what we have, so press OK. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna pick all the columns and we're gonna switch them all in, in terms of their signs. And we're gonna create essentially a mirror image of plus and minus pattern that you see on the screen. So if I press OK, it suggests that we might wanna to go to design evaluation and see what the end result of this is gonna be in terms of the aliasing. So I would say yes. And then uh, we can look at the aliasing and we see that, well, there's actually uh, four factor interactions in here um, that I did not show because normally we don't worry too much about interactions with that many terms in them. But it does turn out that um, main effects are aliased with three factors. So you got a one to three relationship and two factor interactions are aliased with other two factor. So we've gone from aliasing main effects to two factor, which is resolution three up to main effects to three factors. So this has increased the resolution of the design. And the way it works is if I show this in standard order rather than the randomized run, you see that where A was minus in the first block, it's now plus. And you can see that there's a complete reversal of signs here. And this is true for every column. And of course, we're blocking out the second group of runs in case there's some shift that occurs, we'll eliminate that and it won't you know, bias our estimates. Okay, now talking about Plackett Bermans and uh, for this, I've got the guy with the bomb because Plackett and Berman were working in UK. Supposedly they were locked up in a Scottish castle because they had come up with these wonderful test plans in multiples of four that were quick and dirty. What George Box said with these resolution three designs is that it's like kicking the TV to make it work, which I don't recommend with a bomb, but probably there were some pretty crazy things happening, you know, during the blitz and so forth in, in UK. So it was a nice innovation. 
And actually, uh, my favorite design is uh, for ruggedness testing is the 11 factor and 12 runs. As you get a lot of factors that you can throw up against your system to make sure that it's going to withstand, you know, what happens in the field with high humidity, you know, low temperature, whatever those combinations are. However, I don't recommend it for screening. And we see in this NIST Semitech Engineering Stats Handbook that how pervasive this is that plaque impermanence should be used for screening experiments. And then I get a little thrown off here because it's, to me it's kind of an oxymoron that these are good for screening experiments because main effects are in general heavily confounded with two-factor interactions. So I'm, I'm just a little bit puzzled about that, but I just don't see that there are good designs to use and my personal experience with resolution three has not been good. And I've done a lot of experiments and I've seen hundreds and hundreds of other experiments in my rule with studies over the decades. And unfortunately, if you search quote unquote plaque and permanent screening, you'll get hundreds and hundreds of, well, maybe thousands, I, I quit counting. But as I'll demonstrate, if any factors interact and making the assumption that they won't is I think dangerous, these plaque burmans do not serve well for screening. So I'm on this mission. I don't know if I'll ever succeed. I doubt it. I'm kind of uh, fighting the tide here, but I do like the way that the plaque burmans fit the gaps in the two to the power designs with the 12, the 20, the 24 and things like that. But these gap filling designs will partially alias main effects with two factor interactions. For example, in the 12 run design, every main effect gets aliased by plus or minus one third of 45 two factor interactions. So um, if I was to pick a Black and Berman design, which we've got stuck down here in our miscellaneous, here's the 11 and 12. There's a red uh, orange warning that comes up here. This is the aliasing that you see. A is alias with minus a third of BC etc cetera, etc cetera. and there's just well i think it's 45 two factor interactions partially alias and so the way that i've seen this working is it kind of smears out main effects it smears out two factor interactions if there's a strong two factor interaction into multiple main effects and it's just kind of a mad thing but it, it's it's kind of diabolical on the other hand i know there's some arguments about using plaque permanence because of the partial aliasing they go the other direction, so I'm perfectly aware that uh, uh, this is somewhat of an opinionated uh, idea that I have based on my actual experience as an R&D chemical process development engineer and seeing what happens to our clients. Okay, so it's based on what I've seen happening. You know, it's not a theoretical idea at all. So now let's take a look at a design, and this one is one that was published by Doug Montgomery, and it's one that we have as a tutorial in our software. It's called Filtration Rate. And you can see in the note that this is from the design and analysis of experiments, and a wafer board manufacturer is, is trying to reduce formaldehyde, and there's a whole story behind this. But what it is, is a two-level factorial with 16 runs, is a full factorial, and I'm going to use this as a, as a basis to see what happens if we try to take a shortcut with Plaggett Berman. So what I'm going to do is use this half normal plot. I'm going to pick this, pick the standout effects, you know, which are all highly significant and we get a really good model fit. All the diagnostics are good. The ones that I mainly look at normal plot of residuals is fine and so forth. And we see that there are two two-factor interactions, which is a little bit unusual, but it must have been interesting for Doug Montgomery to see this and he felt like it was worth publishing. It's not that common that you would see two-factor interactions and particularly two, but it's not uncommon either. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to uh, open up a second SATIS 360, which I can do because I'm with Staddies and my son Hank is a head of programming. So he set me up to, to have multiple instances. And then I'm going to um, 
take a look at another file that's called filtration rate PB that I created with a simulation. So bear with me, I'm just gonna find that. By the way, I'm currently doing a class for the School of Mines as a semester link class on DOE, which is pretty awesome. Working with their chemical engineering department and this afternoon, they're gonna do a fly off of paper helicopters that they made in class, which is, you know, pretty exciting. So I've got a lot of balls that are being juggled right now. But let me see if I can find this. Okay, here it is. Now, this design has only 12 runs. And yet, supposedly, it's good for screening. So let's see what happens. I'm going to start the analysis on this. And I'm going to use this half normal plot. Now, the first thing we see. If we were to toggle back and forth to the original experiment that I took the model from, from Montgomery and built a simulator, the exact same model with the exact same standard deviation is, it's very flat on the half normal. So there's not as much power. And then if we start picking effects, well, the first one I get is temperature. And temperature does have a big effect. You can see this on a graph of temperature versus the filtration rate. So that does have a big effect either way. Next on the Plackett Berman, I get E. Now hold on a second. Let's look at the list on the left here. E is not a factor, it's a dummy factor. This is not a real factor. It's being flagged out because of the two factor interactions are smearing out on E. So it's not good. And this could happen. So what I did is I took the model from the full design that was published in Montgomery. All right, and so I took this coded equation and I entered it into our simulator. I also know that the standard deviation is 4.42 from this particular set of data, but it's probably a good estimate of the true standard deviation. So I put that into the model. Okay, now what is E and why does that come out? Well, in, in the actual model, we've got minus 9.1 AC and we've got plus 8.3 AD. And both of these interactions are part of the string for aliasing of E. And if you do the math of minus 0.333 or about a, a minus one third of nine, that's about plus three, minus minus is a plus. And they take another third of, well, it's almost nine, another three. Now we have a result of 5.8 and that's what is coming out down here as the second biggest effect. So it's not E obviously, it's a combination of AC and AD. So ultimately then I would say with the plaque at Berman is it's almost a complete fail. At least you did get temperature, you know, coming out, but you missed a lot of other bits of information that came from the full factorial. However, we could try to salvage this block of 12 runs with the opposite level. So just for the heck of it, I thought since I've got the simulator, Let's see what happens with that. So what we can do is go back to our Plackett Berman design with the 12 runs and do the foldover. All right, we do the foldover. We can look at the aliases, but I can tell you that this will uh, give us better resolution. Now it won't be resolution three anymore, but it turns into resolution four um, again, if I show some of the higher order interactions, it'll be a little bit easier to see what happens here. Okay, we still have the partial aliasing, but the main effects are aliased only with three factor interactions. And if we pretend that anything with three letters is zero, it magically disappears. And what we think is a is actually a, and this is commonplace if you 
set up your experiment with the proper types of factors, nothing really crazy, radical, categoric factor. Um, the three factor interactions are very, very unlikely and it's standard practice to, to assume that those are, are just not going to be active and designed accordingly. Now, the two factor interactions remain alias to each other. There's a lot of them here to look at, but here you can see two factor interactions are st still alias, but that's fine. We've made a big improvement on this by doing the fold over. So then I said, well, what would happen if we did a simu simulation again? I've still got the equation and the standard deviation. So I can load a simulation at this point and I can fill out the rest of the data and then I can do the half normal plot. The design is not orthogonal. Okay, I knew that because of the nature of it. And now we've got a pretty nice little picture here. This actually worked. And part of it is a little bit of luck because the two interactions involve A, but it could be a bunch of other interactions, but since A is the biggest effect, and then we have C and D, which are other two main effects, this actually works, but you can't totally count on that. Okay, so I think that that pretty much covers it. So I think I think we did pretty well with this one after we did the fold over. I do suggest that as you go to the characterization stage, which would be a follow up on this, just to make sure that you are right about picking those two factor interactions, then I would add center points. So maybe one more experiment maybe would just be A, C, and D in an eight run experiment with four center points, something like that. And that would carry you down to the next level on the strategy. Okay. So resolution four designs do for screening, not resolution three. And in order of my preference, I would say the resolution for regular two level designs that we code yellow on our builder. But then uh, if you get to have more than, let's say eight factors, there's there's a, a way to, to handle that. And um, it's called minimum run design. I'm gonna live dangerously and see if I can open up a third status. I don't know how many how many Hank is allowing me here. Oh, he let me have three. Maybe there's no limit. But anyways, the eight factors and 16 runs is one I like as a natural minimum run because two times eight or two times K is the minimum number of runs to get the resolution four. If you went to nine factors, then you've got to go up to 32 with the standard. But using optimal design building approach and then forming templates, which make it easier for a lot of our users to always have the same template um, with nine, whereas it would take 32 runs for the standard, you can get it down to actually a minimum of 18. We, we recommend throwing a couple extra runs in in case something goes off. Because if you do just a minimum run resolution four and you, and you lose even one run, it degrades the, the resolution down to three. So we figure we'll give people a couple of botches, you know, Stuff happens, so we'll, we'll allow for that. So that one would be one I, I would recommend. And then there's definitive screening designs. Now we have those in our tool, these DSDs. I'm not a big fan because you've got to do three levels of each factor. And I'm not real hopeful of achieving a shortcut, which is what you can do with these into a super saturated response surface method and try to fit a quadratic equation on a subset of factors. So there's a whole idea here. I know there's a lot of presentation that, you know, promotes this idea. Again, you know, being very conservative. And what George Box said was, when in doubt, build it stout. And uh, I don't know what he thought about this if he even had a chance to study it before he passed away, but it's a legitimate choice. And in particular, it's good for screening and it's very similar for the number of runs two times K. Um, if you're just doing it for screening for main effects, hence the name screening and the name of the design. So it's just when you start using it 
for you know building up to a response surface the idea of the three levels so i'm not saying you know don't do it it's just not my favorite all right so now let's move on to another case study and this one is one where they do pick a resolution four to begin with it's also from montgomery's book and we used to use this in our class when we had more time to spend than we do nowadays but the idea is to screen six factors and 16 runs you can see the list here some are categorical and it turns out that this experiment uncovered some interactions and so we get into the problem of resolution four that two factor interactions are alias with other two factor again it's a two and two on your hand here resolution four and so this introduces some issues and so you can get out of this with a very particular type of fold over but it has to be what's called a semi fold over it's actually half of a full fold over in this case it's going to be eight runs but there's certain tricks involved in doing this and uh so i'll show you that I actually gave this presentation way back when at an ASQ uh, Quality Congress, and I was fortunate enough that Stu Hunter was was in the audience. And afterwards, he said, "You know, this is pretty good, and it's something that he knew about." But to be able to to demonstrate this was something that he thought was was pretty clever. So I was happy to accept that accolade from Stu Hunter. Um, so. Uh, we have to be careful, though, uh, with the type of software you have, when you do get two-factor interactions emerging, the software is not going to be able to separate them out. So it may just arbitrarily label alias two-factor interaction effects with the one that has the smallest degree that comes up first in alphabetical order. So let me just show you how we would handle this. And so now uh, I'm going to close out some of the 360s that I've got open here because otherwise it's going to be too confusing. All right, and then I'm going to open up a file called Filtrate. Let's see if I can find that again. I Just before class, I was going through 10 different teams of helicopter teams that are going this afternoon and I, I was slamming through those files and it's pretty amazing some of the things that the newbies will do um <laughs> when they when they first are learning doe for the analysis so that's a whole nother whole nother can of worms but i'm used to seeing a lot of very unusual decisions made for the design of experiments and then for the modeling that are you know out of line Okay, so this one is going to be the thickness file. And you'll see the factors that I had listed here. This is a randomized run plan. And then we have the average th thickness over here. Now this one, if we were just to spy back by reusing the same factors, was built with six factors and 16 runs. No center points, which is fine. And then hopefully, when the, this gets built, you realize that while this is pretty good for main effects, it's not so good for characterizing two-factor interactions because of the aliasing. But I actually like these uh, resolution four designs. I think oftentimes it's worth doing because if no two-factor interactions come out, that's one thing and you're not in too bad of a shape. If they do, sometimes you can kind of guess at what they are, you know, basis of what are the big main effects that are coming out or there's usually some kind of family structure. But the other thing is that you can always follow up later uh, and do some other design of experiments um, to the alias. So let's just see what happens with this one. All right, and so I'm going to do the analysis of this using the half normal graphical selection process and I'm just going to drag over the ones that stand off to the right. Thanks to Montgomery, we've got a positioning aid and newer versions of the software, whereas before that line would just be kind of randomly applied across all the um, effects. Now it has a recognition of those near the zero level and tends to line up nicely with those. And so it's usually pretty easy to see if there's standout effects and pick those. The Pareto chart shows then, you know, that these are probably going to be very significant basis of uncorrected T value limit, the black line, 
And then the red line is a pairwise corrected bond for owning. I usually tell people if it's above the black line, you might want to consider keeping it for the model and then sorting it out later. All right, but here's here's what's weird is that when you right click over the A B interaction, you would realize that it's alias with C E. And you should know that by now, but we also see it on this list of numeric uh, factors that it's alias with CE. And then as if that's not enough, usually we write, remind people with a screen that comes up that there's an aliasing. But nevertheless, we would look at this and say, well, um, since A and B are really big effects, then AB probably is right, but we also have C and E in the model. So this makes it a little bit consternating. But what we could do is we could press ahead and look at the interaction and somebody with subject matter knowledge could say, well, well yeah, I mean, the effect of spin speed probably does depend on the acceleration. And this is a very plausible interaction. So I would say, fine, if that's what you think, um, press ahead and do some confirmation of that. But keep in mind that this possibly could be the CE interaction. So what I'm gonna do is rename this line of analysis that I picked AB, which was what came up by default. Then I'm gonna add another line and this one, I'm going to try looking at it as if it's the CE interaction. All right, and the way that I do that is when I get to this stage of picking effects, I right click over the AB and I change it to CE. And it's like, wow, I mean, that's weird because it's in the exact same spot. But when you look at the interaction itself, oh, here's a warning about alias terms just to remind us that we do have this issue of CE now that we've picked it is alias with AB, so it would just go in the opposite direction. But here's the interaction. This is the CE interaction. And this is the AB interaction. They're different. And it takes a while to kind of puzzle this out, but if you look at the models in quoted fashion for both the choices of AB versus CE. And we then kind of go back and forth and say, well, okay, here's a model we see CE, isn't it? Here's a model and it's the exact same coefficient, but it's labeled AB. But what's different is that these main effects for the AB are different than the main effects for the CE. And that creates, a, I call it a tilt on these graphs and it kind of changes the look of them from one to the other. So it's the darndest thing that that happens. And it turns out, you know, just as a reminder that there's aliasing of A, B, and C, E. And if we look at display option in quoted fashion, we would see that the A and B columns, if you multiply those together, this is in a random order, let's say minus times a minus is a plus, and then C and E, is plus and plus is a plus. So every time you go across this and you were to do the multiplication of the two AB terms in coded fashion, and you do the same thing with the C and E, you would see that those columns, if you were to uh, put this into a spreadsheet, would have the exact same pattern. So there is no way to separate those without doing further experimentation. So that's that's that. We're kind of at a quandary at this point. And the engineers, in this case, let's say, look at this and they say, well, we could kind of explain how spin speed would depend on the uh, acceleration and it would change depending on whether you have low or high acceleration. We can also kind of see a way clear that possibly it's the volume that depends on which vendor we have. And if that happens, we're stuck. Now, what happens here is people think, well, why don't I do a full foldover? But it turns out that doesn't work. We have to do a semi fold over. So let's go back to this. And do a complete fold over. And for this, I have to override what the program is trying to tell me here. And I'm going to say fold over. And then I'm gonna look at the alias structure. 
Now we thought this would increase the resolution. It did for the resolution three, but for resolution four, huh? Main effects are still alias a three factor, and two is with twos. So, what what just happened? We just did a whole other set of runs, and we didn't really help ourselves in terms of resolution at all. Although we do have more power. So what you want to do instead is do a semi fold over, which is what the program was trying to tell me when I did the augmentation. So this semi fold is going to be particularly good for resolution four designs. And it also is nice because it doesn't involve a complete redo of all the runs, but only half the runs. And then there's some tricks here. You have to pick one of the four factors that we're trying to resolve out. A, B, C, or E. As long as you pick out one of those four factors, A, B, C, or E, then this will de-alias the A, B from the C, E. So I just thought, why don't we pick factor A? Then to get only half of the extra runs, you take another factor that's not something that you're real concerned with, and you change that. Um, and so I decided that we would do the E plus because that was the two different vendors and it just seemed like it would be easier to do that. And I can't remember everything that went involved, you know, in that decision because it was a while back I did this originally. But when you look at the aliasing of this, and we focus on the fact that we were trying to separate out A, B, and C, E, you can see that A, B is only alias now with a three factor direction. The same for the C, E. So this is this is work to to break the the two that were alias with each other, and um, then uh, I have a file that I've I created called thickness semifold that does have the data in it. So now here are the eight runs. Uh, hmm, I think I must have written something down wrong here because you can see I picked factor F. I'm just going to make a fix on my slide here because it's actually semi-fold on A and F plus, which is the cover on. I guess that's probably a good idea to keep that cover on. But it works. Let me just double check the evaluation to make sure that I didn't lead you astray here. We can evaluate any matrix that we collect. And so we should be able to see still that the AB is D alias from the CE, it is. So that's fine. That was just a, a slight little deviation from my plan. Um, and then uh, when we look at the effects, then we see that, hmm, it is a CE that, that is significant. It's this model graph for the CE that's important. And so it's the one at the right which is the interaction with the vendor and not the one at the left, as it turns out when you when you do the semifold. And that's the end of that story. So there you go. There's another a way to salvage your design, but you have to know which which approach to use. So it turns out it's a CE after all, not the A B. We did screen out D and F which was the exhaust. I think that was a cover on and cover off. Um, and he said that we would leave the cover on. And then the spin time over the range that was studied did not have a significant effect. So this resolution four design was pretty effective, but it did leave the question of the two two factor interactions that potentially could be active. And so then with the simply doing eight more by a special procedure called semi fold over, we're able to resolve that and life is good. All right, so then focusing on the screening stage, which I've put a clip up above here, where we're taking known factors and temporarily setting them aside and trying to screen down previously unknown factors. Um, we don't want to include the known factors, don'ts, for the DOE strategy that's shown here. We're going to hold those for the next phase, which is characterization. It'll come down here. 
And we don't want to use resolution three, whether the standard or the plaque at Berman. That's my argument. And hopefully I've convinced you, but if not, do it your way, you know. And if you do, you can do a fold over. But I would rather have you pick resolution four to begin with. And then if two factor interactions do emerge and you can't take a leap of faith and decide which they are, you could do a semi fold over or just pick the interaction you think is active and just do a two by two replicated a couple times. And you might be able to confirm it that way. All right, well, that completes my presentation. I told you I was going to go through this fast. I saw some chat coming up somewhere that there may be a recording, which probably is going to be worthwhile. And we probably have some other recordings on the Stati's YouTube channel of very similar presentations. But just to recap, I was trying to show that if done properly, DOE can provide huge process improvements with, you know, relatively small uh, number of runs. So why not, why not do that? I, I highly recommend it. But don't use the low resolution three two level designs or the Plackett Bermans, you know, save those later for ruggedness. So don't do that. Um, if you do ignore this advice and do the Plackett Berman or the low resolution three, then there is a fix. And what that is, is a complete fold over. Or sometimes you just say fold over. Okay, so that'll that'll increase it from resolution three to resolution four. You do have to double the number of runs, but and also it'll be a new block. But if you do it right the first time, or as Bach said, you might as well do it right. If you're gonna do it, um, choosing a resolution four from the start, uh, or you can use these minimum run screening designs, or in other software tools, I think they would be optimal alias optimal designs are called that are good for screening. You have to be careful to pick the right optimal design. And there is a fine line, you know, there in terms of the screening and trying to get that minimum number of runs. So I hope the mission was accomplished. That'll be for you to, to gauge, but hopefully you learned something along the way. Um, as far as references are concerned, of course, I've got to recommend this trilogy of simplified books that I'm the primary author of, just because it keeps it simple and makes it fun as opposed to the Montgomery textbook, which is quite good, but it's a lot weightier and gets into a lot more detail. So pretty much everything that I covered is covered in this first of the, the trilogy, which is a DOE simplified. And that's readily available from Amazon or the like. So with that, I'm gonna conclude my presentation. There's just a couple of minutes left and hopefully you can make the most of every experiment from well-designed screening DOEs. So thank you very much for, for listening. Great, Mark, that was awesome. Um, I did have a quick question that came up. Um, so we do have a couple minutes left. Sure. Um, there was a question about um, your favorite analysis method for screening experiments beyond the half normal plot. Well, um, I'm a huge fan of the half normal plot, also known as Daniel plot. And actually when Hunter attended my presentation on the semi fold over, uh, I asked him why in the box and Hunter book, they use full normal plots. And I saw one today from one of my helicopter students that did the full normal and they got it all wrong. The half normal anchors it at the lower left corner. It's done an absolute value scale. And Hunter said that Daniel um, had first suggested to Box Hunter and Hunter they do half normal, and then he changed his mind and said to do full normal, so they published it. But while they were publishing, he said, no, no, do the half normal plot. So they got completely twisted around by Daniel. I also like the Pareto char chart, and you've probably seen me pulling that up here. But what I, what I like to do is pick using the half normal, and then look at the Pareto chart and use that as your presentation for the management and so forth, because it's easier to explain. You know, most people know what a T value is. You can kind of wave your hands and say, well, the red line is pairwise corrected. Uh, some people do use um, regression tools, such as stepwise backward, using a P value criterion of say 0.1. We have tools like that for our response service models. 
So that would be more of a numerical type approach. Those are the two main approaches that I would recommend. But for the two level design, I, I highly recommend the graphical. Great. I don't see any other questions here, um, except for a lot of questions about the recording, which will be posted on our YouTube channel um, for ASQ Stats Division. And that's in the chat. I posted that link. Um, so if anybody else has a question, you'll have to get it in the chat really quickly. Otherwise, we're going to close. Um, yeah, and they can send an email to me. It might, yep, okay. it might, there might be some questions, way. you know, or some arguments. So I'd be happy to, you know, listen to, to any ideas that people have. I'm, I'm always trying to learn. Sounds great. All right. Well, I think we're going to end the webinar today. I want to thank our presenter, Mark. That was a very good webinar. Uh, we've had a lot of very good comments already in the chat from the attendees. So, <laughs> so thank you very much for the presentation. And thanks for happy to apply. Yeah, hopefully I'll see you guys again in future. Um, got a lot of thoughts, so um, I've, I think I've done two or three of these over the years, but uh, hopefully I'll, I'll circle back again someday. That would be great. Okay, All right. Thanks, everyone. Okay, take care. Take care, everybody.